So there's one really important construction of representations that I haven't yet discussed, uh, namely the dual representation. So if I give you a representation R from G to GLV, then I get a dual representation R star from the same group, so GL of the dual vector space. So first let me tell you what the dual vector space is, and then I'll define the dual representation. Well, the dual vector space, V dual, V star, is defined to be the set of linear maps from V to the field we're working over, which is usually C. Equivalently, you could define it in the following way. If you think of V as a space of column vectors by picking a basis of V, then V dual will be the corresponding set of row vectors. So these are equivalent um, in the following way. So if I give you an element alpha in HOM V to C, you can give me back a row vector, which I'll write as alpha underline in the following way. So first of all, let's pick a basis of V and think of elements as uh, column vectors v1 down to vn. Well then alpha of v is just going to be something of the form alpha 1 v1 plus dot 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 plus alpha n vn. So if we define alpha underline to be the row vector alpha 1 up to alpha n, this is precisely alpha underline matrix multiplied into the vector v. Uh, going back, if I have a row vector um, w equals w1 up to wn, then I get w over line, w bar, um, which is the linear map that sends v to w1 v1 plus dot 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 plus wn vn. So that's an element of HOM v to c. So this is a bijection. It shows us that we can really think of HOM V to C as row vectors. So how do I define the dual representation? Well, if I have a row vector W and a matrix M, I get a new row vector WM. In other words, I multiply matrices into row vectors on the right. So here's how I'm going to use this. For each G in G, I'm supposed to give you a map R star G from V dual to V dual. And this is going to send a row vector alpha underline to alpha underline R G inverse. All right, so I'm multiplying on the right, but not by R G, instead by R G inverse. So this is what I'm defining to be R star G of alpha. So all this messing with underlines and stuff is, is really just so that I can distinguish between when I'm multiplying by a matrix and when I'm applying a linear map. On the right hand side of this expression, this is R star of G applied to alpha. And on the left hand side of the expression, I'm writing this as a row vector times a matrix, and that's supposed to be the row vector corresponding to this guy. So maybe I should even put a, an underline here to say this is the row vector corresponding to R star G alpha. Okay, don't get carried away by the notation. The idea is I'm multiplying on the right by R G inverse. So let's see why this works and why we need to have the inverse there. That's the key thing. Uh, R star G1, G2 of alpha, is the row vector corresponding to this, is alpha underline R G1, G2 inverse. So that's alpha underline R G1, R G2, all inverse. That is alpha underline of R G2 inverse, R G1 inverse because when you invert a product of matrices, you switch the order. And now let's look at this bit here. Um, alpha underline RG2 inverse is um, 
the row vector corresponding to r star g2 of alpha and now this is the row vector corresponding to r g1 sorry r star g1 r star g2 of alpha okay so now just take the underlines off get rid of the alphas and you've got precisely the expression you want r star g1 g2 equals r star g1 r star g2 so this is a representation okay so i just want to prove some nice properties of the dual and uh, work out some examples now um, so first if um, r is a representation of su2 on some complex vector space v Uh, with weight diagram, let's say with a given weight diagram, then our dual has uh, the weight diagram. Maybe I'll, I'll give the weight diagram a name, I'll call it D. It has weight diagram D dual, which is actually equal to D. So the point will be that the weights of this representation get the sign switched in the dual representation. In other words, if you have a weight space with weight n, you're going to end up with a weight space with weight minus n. But SU2 representations have this nice symmetry that the weight diagram is symmetric about the origin. So you're going to end up with the same weight diagram, and this is going to imply that actually R is isomorphic to R dual for any SU2 representation. So let's see why this is true. What does it mean to be uh, a weight vector with weight n? It means that R of um, e to the i theta 0, 0, e to the minus i theta of v equals e to the i n theta v. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, apply dagger to both sides of this equation. So v dagger r e to the i theta 0, 0 e to the minus i theta and dagger equals um, e to the minus i n theta v dagger. So what is dagger? Remember, dagger is the conjugate transpose. So v was a column vector. It's now v dagger, which is a row vector. And it's the row vector whose entries are sort of v1 bar up to v. Uh, well, just uh, depends what dimension the representation is, doesn't it? Let's say vk bar. Now, I have an invariant Hermitian in a product on my representation, as I've discussed before. Um, and if I pick a basis which is orthonormal with respect to that, uh, then um, my representation matrices are actually going to be unitary matrices. In other words, R of this matrix dagger is the same as R of this matrix inverse. So this is R of e to the i theta e to the minus i theta inverse. In other words, that's r star of e to the i theta 0, 0, e to the minus i theta. So this is this is using the uh, existence of an anti-hermission, sorry, an invariant hermission in a product. Okay, so this is exactly telling us that our dual e to the i theta 0, 0, e to the minus i theta has v dagger as a weight vector of weight minus n. So um, the weight spaces of our dual are sort of in weights. Well, let's say the weights of our dual are minus the weights. of R. And because the weights of R have this symmetry about the origin, uh, let's 
supposed to be a symmetry. Um, you know, they already occur in pairs with opposite sign. So this tells us R is isomorphic to R dual. Another example, let's do SU3. The same argument tells us that the weights of R dual are minus the weights of R. So for example, if R is the standard representation, um, the weights are L1, L2, and L3. So R dual will have weights minus L1, minus L2, and minus L3. Now those are different. Those diagrams are different. Therefore, these are not isomorphic representations. Now they're both three-dimensional, but they're not the same representation. So this is the first example of this happening, right? We, we didn't even notice this for SU2. So last time we talked a bit about the quark model and I told you that, you know, you can stick three quarks together by tensoring three copies of the standard representation together. Well, it turns out if you want to tensor, or if you want to combine a quark and an anti-quark, which is something else you can do, then you need to tensor C3 with C3 dual. Uh, I claim if you do that, what you get is a copy of gamma 1,1 and a copy of the trivial representation. I'll leave this as an exercise for you to do using all the methods we've seen so far. And again, this will correspond to a classification of mesons. So mesons are particles that are not as heavy as baryons because they've only got two quarks in them, or a quark and an antiquark. So let's look at the table of mesons. So there it is. Um, so there are nine of them. Uh, there's the K0, K plus. Um, so these have strangeness one. So they're going to be made up of like an up and an anti strange or a down and an anti strange quark. So I guess this one will be the down and the anti strange quark because uh, they have the same charge. They'll cancel when you, when you take the anti particle. Uh, and this will be the up and the anti strange. And these are strangeness zero, strangeness minus one. The charge goes across, so we go from negative on the left to positive on the right. And so when we decompose this as a direct sum of irreducibles, there are eight particles in an octet and one singlet. So the funny thing that happens is the eta particle and the eta prime particle here, they don't, it, isn't, so it doesn't quite work the way we want it to. So um, it turns out you need to take a linear combination of the eta and the eta prime particles called the, the eta eight particle to get this guy in the middle. And then there's an eta one, I think, called it's because it's in a singlet by itself. Um, okay, so that's the same story works for mesons as well. And yeah, yet another triumph of physics and of Lee theory.